when you were a boy, you guys had an upright piano at the house. I'm wondering if you still had that piano, would you let Elton touch it or no? <laughs> uh, no. Well, the guests attacked the stage and started <laughs> dragging the leads out of the microphones and shutting the band up. And eventually the police were called. What's the proper way to make haggis? Oh, shit. Don't ask me that. Because one, I don't know. And two, you don't want to know. Do you have any roadies that you would never hire again? Uh, Probably, but I'm not going to say who they are. With Working with a guy like Elton, I mean, what am I going to try and do? Upstage him in some way? I don't <laughs> think so. Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Davey. Hey, man. How you doing? Well, well. Hi, Steve. Hi there. Hi, Davey. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. Okay. Steve Hackett is an English musician, singer, songwriter, and record producer. He gained prominence as the lead guitarist of the progressive rock band Genesis from 1971 to 1977. He also co-founded the supergroup GTR. As a solo artist, he's released 26 albums. And Steve Ackett was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2010 as a member of Genesis. Last year, he released Under a Mediterranean Sky and Surrender of Silence. If you haven't listened to those albums, I urge you to do so. David Johnstone's my second guest. He's been working with Elton John since 1971. In addition, he's worked with Stevie Nicks, Joan Armatrading, Meatloaf, Alice Cooper, Hans Zimmer, B.B. King, Belinda Carlisle, Rod Stewart, Leo Sayer, and Olivia Newton-John. His album, Deeper Than My Roots, was released this year, and I urge you to listen to that. First question here is for Davey. And I listened in an interview. You said that when you were a boy, you guys had an upright piano at the house. I'm wondering if you still had that piano, would you let Elton touch it or no? Uh, no, that house is long gone. The piano is long gone. Uh, we're talking about in the mid 50s here when I was um, growing up in as a little kid in Edinburgh, Scotland. And um, my parents loved to have musical nights. They didn't actually play themselves. My, one of my sisters played a little bit. Actually, both of them played a little bit but they were 10 years and 12 years older than me, respectively. Uh, but, you know, my mom and dad love musical evenings. So occasionally, I mean, it's a big thing in Scotland. People love just getting up and belting out a song. They, usually they're pissed when they're doing it. They're half drunk. And, uh, <laughs> but it's a big thing. You know, I mean, you, you, if you know who, I'm sure Steve <laughs> knows who Billy Connolly is, but Billy's yeah. the past master of, of, of describing how the Scotsman who's very they're, drunk... They're very a very yeah. funny impression of, of, wow. of a drunken Scotsman. Yeah, indeed. There you go. Yeah. Have you guys met one another? I'm sorry. Have you we haven't actually. Another? We've never met. I mean, I've actually been in the States since 1983. I moved over here. Yeah. So I kind of lost touch with the British scene quite a lot, except when I was going back to work there. But no, we never did. But I'm a big fan of Steve's work. I really love your guitar play, man. There's some wonderful things oh. over the years. Oh, listen, listen, I, I very much like your play. I'm not just saying that. I think it's very, very good. Um, I'm aware of the things with Elton. Uh, I'm not aware of other things, but but that tells me that that it's 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 very, very good. I, I really love, uh, you know, Funeral for a Friend, or all, all of that, you know, that thing I thought was, was great. And um, the version of Lucy in the Sky, I, I, I like very much, like the guitar work on that, and many things. So, you know, yeah, I'm certainly well, aware we of got, that. We've got Mutual Admiration Society here. I love that. Well, interesting. Yeah. So I did a cheat today, too. I did a cheat where uh, I asked the fans this morning, but I asked them, you know, what were questions would you have? Your fans just said, hi, Davey. <laughs> But okay. but Steve got a few questions. Steve got a few. 
One of them I thought was interesting, and it's by a guy named Don No, and he asks, um, Davey takes a Hackett-like solo on I Feel Like a Bullet on Rock of the Westies. Are you conscious of that? Was that a... He would like to... I absolutely, I absolutely wasn't, and Steve is not going to get any of the, the royalties I got from playing on that. <laughs> that was the trick uh, question. No, I wasn't, actually. That was really a one-off thing with a, with a volume pedal. Um, a, quite a long solo that, that it was one of those where you had to get kind of deep. And in those days, let's face it, in the mid 70s, we were all very deep into one thing or another. There was a lot of tomfoolery going on. Um, but yeah, I, I remember that solo. Um, but yeah, I honestly didn't do it to emulate Steve in any way, although I could have done. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not. I'm not aware of, of what what the song is, so I I, I can't comment. But uh, um... here's another one. This one's for you, Steve. <laughs> Mike Coombs, beautiful tone on the guitar solo and Firth of Fifth on Seconds Out. What was your rig? At that time, it was um, it was a Les Paul. It was um, a 1957 Les Paul, which I still have. Um, uh, the amps I was using Roland Jazz Chorus amps at the time probably using far too much chorus on everything and um uh but that you know that's just just the way it was i think when chorus amps came out everyone just sort of flooded their sound and in, in that so i've noticed that many things from that era seem to have you know excess chorus and then 1980s early 1980s lots of lots of chorus funnily enough i'm thinking of doing something with the chorus sound now and i can't even remember what the hell it was but i thought i know what it was it was going back and doing something there's a genesis album which is foxtrot which we're going to be doing the whole of and i oh, used wow. two leslie cabinets leslie cabinets were pre um chorus units really forgetting that and tony banks who played keyboards with genesis had had two homemade um chorus units but they sounded great and if sorry uh, uh, a Leslie, Leslie cap, and yeah. and uh, if you use both of them at the same time, it was a glorious sound. And I'm, and uh, I don't have chorus units. Uh, well, I've got chorus units, but I don't have the Leslies to hand. No one's got those big things, so I'm I'm probably going to do it with a with a chorus thing. That's so, great, Le Steve. I I loved your Leslie work that you've done. I've heard it, and I really. And I loved it, especially because I'm a huge Leslie fan as well. Yes. I've used on, you mentioned Lucy the other day. Uh, I used mm -hmm. it, so many things that I used on back in the day, and I just loved the effect. Um, yes. We even got, um, we, we used um, the, the French violin, jazz violin, as Jean-Luc Ponty on, a, on an yes. album. And he put his violin, we showed him, because I had a little one of those little guitar controllers where you plug it in, straight into the Leslie. And yes. uh, we had him do that with his violin, and he immediately was, blown away and did the solo right. one of the solos we wanted with that sound but yeah, yeah you and i used guitar leslie a lot i think my i was copying not copying but i got that effect from from george really from from harrison because uh yes i was a big fan we of all, all the did. stuff he did and yeah, yeah i mean the governor you know and such a great guy and a great player and um yeah so we bought that and also we're both kind of well i know i am uh I play lots of different kind of guitars, but Les Paul has always been my standard. That's always kind of what I'm known for. I think yeah. I always know what I'm going to get with the Les Paul. You know, straight ahead, yes. you can get yes. that maniac sound straight away. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's a great sound. I've, I've been in recent years using Fernandez um, guitars mm -hmm. with the sustainer. It's got the Les Paul shape, but it's got the, the sustainer. And it's got some other sounds, obviously, that, that you can't get with with a Les Paul, but, but they're both, they're both great guitars. Yeah. They're wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, well, we, we could probably talk guitars all day, couldn't we? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Go Back figure. to the questions. <laughs> Here's another one. David Smith on the song, Blue Part of the Town. What's the brand of the harmonica and what did you put the harmonica through? Yeah, it's a blue part of town. I believe at that time I was using PV Classic 50 amp, and uh, oh, I think it was an AKG 414 uh, microphone, but it, it, it's distorted and it has vibratos, and uh, and it was pretty spontaneous, and it was just accompanied by um, Julian Colbeck on on uh, 
on piano doing a kind of Rhodes sound. So um, yeah, that, that thing kind of wrote itself. It's it's a nice yeah. sound. A harmonica is what I played years before guitar. I was doing ten years of of harmonica before I'd even touched a guitar. So that oh, was wow. uh, as a kid. That was that was my go to instrument. Sonny Boy Williamson. Yeah, absolutely love Sonny Boy oh, Williamson, so and um, I got to spend some time with um, Larry Adler. Funnily enough, um, oh, a couple wow. of occasions, which was very nice because he was a childhood hero of mine but I, I was blown away in the mid 60s when I saw Paul Butterfield Paul Butterfield band with um, the blues band with um, uh, with Mike Bloomfield and Elvin Bishop Al Cooper yes yeah and 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 he was an absolute master of, of the blues harmonica it sounded it sounded like a guitar it sounded like a trumpet it was this tiny little instrument he could get so many tones out of it and just had great vibrato and fabulous control. Uh, okay, a couple last ones here. Dorian, Marcel, uh, favorite album is Please Don't Touch. It's going to be the 45th anniversary next year. Any intentions of revisiting the album because it is his, it's his favorite? Well, in recent years, I've been revisiting a lot of Genesis stuff. And uh, so, you know, this year, it's, it's 50 years ago that we did a mere 50 years ago that it was Foxtrot. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically going to be taking that that out um, as of a couple of weeks' time. So um, I don't know. I, I, I'd forgotten that anniversary might be coming up, you know, 45 years of, of Please Don't Touch. Um, there are things on it. That I, I, I tell you what I love doing. I don't know if, if either of you ever met Richie Havens, but he sang a couple of songs on that because... Um, he was on one of the Genesis shows back back in the day and um, once or twice. And uh, I, I invited him over when he was in London, when he was supporting us. And um, um, he was just wonderful to work with. He was um, he was absolutely glorious, very unstarry, very larger than life, but in, insisted on traveling in the back of the van when he was picked up at the airport. And he'd flown from New York to L.A., and I swear we had him straight in the studio that day and he was learning stuff and it was about three in the morning. And he said, have you got any more songs? I said, you must be tired by now. You've just flown in. And he said, no, I don't get tired. And we did another song on the spot and it was just wonderful. He was mind bendingly quick on the uptake and he kind of just took control. He, that was my album. He took control of the, of the sessions he just said oh you know you want me to sing it why don't you come out on the studio floor and play guitar and we we're just three feet away from each other and it's a bit like god looking to you for approval with that glorious yeah. voice that he that he had you know and mm -hmm. so the most amazing experience of working with a singer was was working with him he was um just something else that's neat okay, the last fan question which i think is a good question for both of you guys Brian Birch, and he asks, um, did you ever meet Alan Holdsworth and would you have collaborated with him? I didn't meet him, but I mean, he, I was a big fan of him. Uh, never met him, although my roadie, funnily enough, back then in the in the 70s, Steve Vidouris was a massive Holdsworth fan. And Steve's actually one of those, one of those um, daunting guitar techs or roadies that you have who plays so well you know, and then you think, oh, Christ, you know, what am I going to do now? He's going to hand me a perfectly in tune guitar. I better be good, you know. Um, but he was a massive uh, Alan Hallsworth fan. And, of course, my thing back then was more uh, John McLaughlin because I was a massive fan of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Uh, when they first came out, I remember being uh, around at Paul Buckmaster's house. He used to have a music evening at his place in Barnes. Um, and he would play albums. And there was always musicians who were there gathering around listening to the next album by whoever. One was by the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Inner Mounting Flame, which is just an amazing album. And the other one was James Brown, Sex Machine. So mm -hmm. it was a very wide, eclectic, we were listening to everything. It wasn't like you didn't listen to one thing because that wasn't cool or whatever. You listened to absolutely the whole thing. Yeah. And that's what I loved about music back then. That some of that seems to have been lost, I feel. Um, because, you know, when I used to come to the States the first couple of times, I was amazed by FM radio 
because you would get maybe a, a Johnny Mitchell track and then you'd get a Hendrix track straight after it and then you'd get something entirely different, maybe the Beach Boys or something. Um, I love that idea and I still actually search out radio stations who play everything and who are not just trying to pigeonhole music all the time because unfortunately I think that's become a, a dangerous thing. That's tends to, to what, what, what's happened with music, in my opinion, yeah. has been a lot of pigeonholing in that way. And it's sad to see. Hmm. Did, did you ever meet um, Gary? Did, uh, sorry, Gary Husband, who, 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 who plays you know, piano with, with, with him, plays keyboards with John McLaughlin and also drums with Level 42. I don't know how that's humanly possible, but I wondered if you, <laughs> Davey, whether you'd ever met john mclaughlin yourself as a, oh as a yeah yeah because oh, yeah. he's also he's also from scotland so you know yeah uh, at that time the john was it was jan hammer was his keyboard player back then that was the ridiculous yeah. band yeah. uh but no i never met dave i don't think and jerry goodman i wonder i wonder if he had yeah. met, met him because you know oh, yeah, such yeah. A phenomenal violin uh, yeah. uh, uh guy you know I, I know that gary had worked with with him as well, so um, and I think there's that Scottish connection. Um, yes. But uh, you're quite right that that um, that uh, Mahavishnu were a, were a big influence. Um, it was myself and Phil Collins and Chester Thompson. We would be sitting around listening to Inner Mountain Flame and right. and um, and all the rest. And um, I liked the one with with orchestra. The um, Firebirds was it? Uh, well, now what? It's it's another it's another one one produced by George Martin and um, it's got ah. um, Vision is a Naked Sword on it and John Luke Ponty is on it funnily enough yeah 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 uh, I think it's called Apocalypse funnily enough and um, so Genesis wasn't the only band to name something Apocalypse <laughs> um, and um, yeah that was um, I loved hearing what orchestra Mike Gibbs had done orchestrations. Lovely to hear what he'd done with stuff that was plainly written on on guitar. It suddenly right. handed over to orchestra, arpeggiated guitar stuff, guitar picking. Suddenly, an orchestra doing it sounded yeah. absolutely wonderful. And I very nearly worked with with Mike, but I never met John. And uh, I always think it would be nice just to pay homage. And we're not absolutely. really all the rest. Yeah. yeah, and I notice he's playing a gig uh, coming up fairly soon here in California. So I'm, I think I'll be gone already, but I always keep a lookout for where he's playing because I loved all his stuff all the way through Shakti and the different thing, the stuff with mm. Carlos Santana, which was wonderful. Uh, just a it's, brilliant mind and a very, very, such a modest and, and amazing guy, super sweet, you know. And the stuff with Miles Davis too, which is yeah. very, very interesting. Right. Um, tracks like Little Church, where mm. they're all, I think, Maybe they were all using wah wah or something, but you can't tell. Right. Actually, each instrument announces itself. It seems, you know, around that era, you can't really tell what's coming in. Is it keyboard? Is it, you know, is it guitar? Yeah. Is it from pit? I think that idea that people were talking about that he, um, Miles wanted to work with Hendrix and right. um, a shame that that never happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's a great sound, though, right? I think a lot of people, you and I, obviously were into it back then. But I loved especially the fact that the guitar top line and whatever theme they were into, um, obviously the violin would be playing the same thing, and possibly Jan Hammer would be playing the same thing, same thing on the synth. Yes. So as yep. you say, the collaboration of those instruments, it was hard to discern which was which, but it really reminded me a lot of Irish traditional music. That's what made my ears prick up because it reminded me of that that lovely mix you get with penny whistle and violin and yeah. uh, and banjo and that when you get, you know, so it's awesome. I love that thing with, yeah. with uh, different instruments together. So I was um, looking into you, Davey, or, well, John kind of clued me and John Mann, but um, trying to piece together. So you were a street busker in Scotland for a bit. And then the question was, did you... Did Elton buy you your first electric guitar? He he was saying on Honky Chateau around that era, he didn't know if you had a guitar that you. I know he, he it's, it's one of those stories that he he even actually tells it on stage. 
So it's kind of like a big white lie, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'd only dabbled, quite honestly, quite truthfully, with electric guitar when I played with a folk rock band called Magna Carta for about a year before I joined Elton. Yeah. Um, but I was originally brought in to play acoustic guitar on Mad Men Across the Water. That, that was the title track. And um, I was a friend of Gus Dudgeon. And there were some great acoustic guitar players, obviously. There always are brilliant acoustic players back then. Um, but I believe they tried it with Mick uh, Ronson and they tried it again with um, Michael Chapman, who was an extraordinary acoustic player, a wonderful guy from, um, he was from Yorkshire somewhere out there in, in uh, Halifax or something. Um, but they actually suggested me. They both, I've never had that happen before where other musicians said, you should get Davey for that. And that's what happened. You know, I, I went in as a young, you know, 20 year old going, what, what's this? And, you know, I didn't even know who Elton John was. So but anyway, I met this guy, Reg, and they asked me to come up with something for this, this piano intro that he had. And I played something and he said, that's it. We love it. And that was kind of how I got into it. But I wasn't, you know, uh, playing electric guitar on a regular basis at that point. It was just once or twice in a set with Magna Carta. So I had a Strat. I had an old Strat that I took with me to the Chateau when we went to make the first album with Elton because there was no rehearsal. I mean, we're talking, he never rehearses to this day. I mean, I do all the rehearsals for the band nowadays, have done for the last God, 40 years probably. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, it, there was no rehearsal. So I just showed up with my Strat, my mandolin, my banjo, a couple of acoustic guitars and a Spanish guitar. And that was it. And, um, you know, so lots of double track and lots of fun. But it also changed. Um, you know, he bought me my first Les Paul that I'd actually picked out for him in Manny's in New York City, which I'm sure Steve knows about. It's a great, amazing store. And um, it's gone now, unfortunately. But, but um, I picked out the guitar. He wanted to get buy a guitar. And I said, well, that's the one you should get. And it was like a 71 Deluxe um, Les Paul, three pickups, and amazing. And um, I actually still have that one to this day. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, interesting how we all get our starts in different ways. My, my initial, my, my, my biggest instruments back then, I was known as actually a tenor banjo player because it was folk music. That's how I came up uh, and knew a lot of the guys who were to become members of other bands, like yeah. Dave Swarbrick joined Fairbrook Convention and Rick Wakeman joined Yes. You know, we were all mates in the kind of folkish scene. And... Um, so it's wonderful how all that all that sprouted and made sense in the early 70s. Were you street busking for a while or? Actually, no, I did that for a laugh. Um, uh -huh. You know, I did that with Peter Knight from Steel Ice Fan. Uh, before we were, you know, doing anything, we were just hanging out together, having fun. But we weren't skint or anything. We weren't broke. But we went uh, with our banjo and our violin uh, down to the, you know, Marble Arch and down at the, the, down the tube station and we, until we got moved on, we'd stand there and play. And we actually made quite a bit of money. You know, so we'd go and have a curry and then go home. It was brilliant. <laughs> That's good. Um, what's the proper way to make haggis? Oh, shit. Don't ask me that. Because one, I don't know. And two, you don't want to know. Yeah. It involves sheep's intestines and a lot of dodgy ingredients. So watch out. <laughs> All right. So, Steve, uh, so you're in Quiet World. And uh, you're yes. playing with your brother, I read. And um, yep. so you they get phil collins couple months goes by you you fall into the fold and basically yeah. you and mike weatherford just kind of i guess you could say hit it off on a musical note um what did your brother do during the time you were with genesis because he he came back with you when you started doing solo albums that's right well john um was learning flute he was also a, a, you know a, a really good guitarist as it happens but uh, he and I both bought a flute after we'd seen um, it was Ian McDonald uh, of King Crimson oh, wow. who in inspired us both to buy a flute but after three weeks I think I, I just gave up went back to guitar and, and harmonica of course but he um, made it his lifelong profession and um, uh, I can't remember what the question was now it's getting late here, but there we oh, go. Oh, sorry. So it's, it was... Um... Hey, one, one thing begets another, I guess. What did he you do know? while you were in Genesis those years? Yeah, that's right. That's Well, he uh, was more studious than me. He went to Cambridge to study languages. Now, oh, cool. um, in 1975, he wasn't very happy. I visited him in, in Cambridge, and I think he felt um, it, it wasn't really where he wanted to be. 
So I said to him, well, I'm going to make an album. Do you want to be part of it? Do you want to be on it? This was going to be my first solo album. And I thought, I don't know how it's going to go. I might come out with a bunch of outtakes or I might come out with a finished album. As it happens, I was probably more prepared for that than any other album I've ever done. No. I was so worried it would fail. As it happened, it did okay. And uh, he played wonderfully on it. It was his professional debut. And um, shortly after that, he he went to, to music college. He was also playing gigs with me. He, he relocated to Sheffield. He was at college there doing music. He was much more happy. He was in my band for um, a couple of years. So, you know, we, we basically toured the UK, Europe, the States. Yeah, that's good. Um, and that was that was great. Yeah. Wonderful. And he's still doing that. And he has his own own band now, just to say, you know, he has the John Hackett band. And they've got a phenomenal guitarist from there for that called Nick Fletcher, who's an amazing jazz rock, furiously fast player. And uh, I'm very pleased with John that he's doing gigs. He did a gig with Focus the other day. They did a festival together. Oh, wow. And that that's, I'm very pleased for John that he's that he's got that and his band's getting good reviews and uh, yeah. very, very happy for him. Were there any other guitarists that you knew of other than Ronnie Carl? Is that correct, Carl? That were uh, trying to be in Genesis other than you at the time? Any, comp any uh, competitors? Well, they 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 had somebody. Uh, now, my predecessor really in Genesis was Anthony Phillips. Ant Phillips. And Ant wrote a lot of the really great songs that Genesis had around about the time of Trespass, the album they did before I joined. Um now they had another guy called Mick and Mick Barnard that he had been with them for a few months, but they weren't happy with him. I I gather because the story I heard was that he didn't want to play twelve string, and I I had to sell a twelve string in order to buy my first Gibson, you know, big borrow or steel, and it was you know that was that was terrible to have to say goodbye to it. But joining Genesis suddenly, I was I was able to get. Now, Les Paul, a stack, high watt stack, and and uh, I think it was a, it might have been a Hagstrom, twelve string, something like that. It was, it was great to be fully kitted up, and mm. then I was unlucky enough to have uh, two Les Pauls stolen oh. Um, oh. in the early days of Genesis, and then a few years later, an another one was stolen, um, oh. and it, it was always, it was always the same in in transit from one gig to another something would happen and so um um you know that's a that's a dangerous habit to have isn't it i don't know if you have you lost any guitars at all davy i i really have as soon as i heard you saying that I, my heart just dropped for you man um yeah we had a, a we had one but it was just extraordinary they stole the whole truck it was um we'd done a gig in sheffield and mm. The guy who was driving the equipment back to London um, was in, under strict instructions, of course, not to stop. But I kept running about Birmingham. He got too tired or something. And he went into this bed and breakfast or something, left the truck out and something. And he was being followed. He had no idea, of course, you know. But yeah. in that hall, they got a, a bunch of things. They got, um, first of all, they, they got an old gold top, Les Paul which I got in Nashville from George Gruen shop. And um, it was just a phenomenal guitar that was on many of the stuff that we'd done. And this was in 74, this robbery. So they got right. that. I also had the third Fender mandolin ever made. Uh, the, the, the code was 0003. Uh, that was, the, the, you know, and D had two beautiful old, uh, one precision and one jazz bass stolen the same thing and they took a, they grabbed a couple of nigel's toms for good measure and they took my also my gibson mandolin which was 100 years old Ooh. so so when you get that kind of a thing happen what it did to me actually it immediately put me off buying any more vintage stuff uh even right. though which is interesting when i think about it a lot of the stuff that i was playing back then for instance the old strat that i had and a couple of other things they're all vintage now because it's been, you know, 50-odd yes. <laughs> yes. years since, we, since I had them. But, no, it put me off the idea of collecting, because I love these instruments so much. Right. And it really tore me apart when I lost them. 
I know, I know what you mean. And there's that terrible story of um, also of Eric Clapton with John Mayall's Blues Breakers, the the Beano album, which is seminal yeah. for, for guitarists. That that yeah. was stolen apparently shortly after the sessions had happened. That that beautiful tone, that incredible sound. Yeah. Um, and Eric, I believe, said um, it felt like he was playing two playing two guitars when he was playing that. It must have mm. felt felt very alive. Yeah, it's why I think it's it's so criminal. I don't think the thieves really have an idea. They're missing out on the whole part of it that is important to us. Not only is yeah. it, are they the tools of our trade, but yeah. there's a, this, we've turned them into something really special. They're part of our body, obviously, because that's what we've made them. You know, yeah. uh, so it, it's a it's a really horrible vocation. I know, like about five or six years ago, um, actually more. It's more like ten now. Tom Petty had all his guitars stolen uh, really? from, a, a, from a, a storage unit here in LA. They oh, got wow. them back. They got them back, amazingly enough, because he offered to pay uh, more. But um, they found the guys who, who had done it. And um, they took them into a pawn shop, I think. Yeah, they're it's just stupid. You know, what? They don't, they're fucking idiots, obviously. But, you know, um, it's very, very, I'm just glad that they got all those great old 12 strings of Tom's and a couple mm. of Mike Campbell's uh, Duesenbergs, which are great guitars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When I was first putting this podcast together, my friends have children now in elementary school. My friend's daughter said that I should ask every guest when they first felt famous. And so I ask <laughs> each of you guys, when did you first feel famous? If fame isn't, uh, I don't know, a way you want to answer the question or whatever. When was there a moment in your career that spawned something within you to really focus and move on? What would each of you guys choose as your moments? Oh, this is from a fifth grader. So. Go on, Steve. Yeah, right, right. Uh, uh, um, I don't know. I don't think you ever really feel famous. You know, when you're at an airport and you're just another guy queuing up with everybody else, it certainly has been the case in my life, you know. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I think that flame, fame, flame is 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 extremely fleeting. Someone might recognise you on the way to the gig because there's a vested interest. Someone's coming to the show, but you know, I I I can I can walk down the street any any day of the week, and, and no one's going to go, you know, that's that's him. You know, I mean, it happens occasionally, but um, uh, I've I've never sought out fame. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to sell records without being famous? Unfortunately, it's part of the game, isn't it? Mm. Authors mm, yeah. like yourself, and you've had success. You know, this is the thing. Um, no one's expecting you. You know, no one's going to confuse you with with the product they're going to buy the product because they like the product but yeah there's this thing about you know artists you know you you buy it because you're in love with them you know this whole sort of cult of personality all of that but you know the work is separate from me i make a noise for a living that's what i do yeah uh, but um you know it's not as if um i'm gregory peck do you know what i'm saying <laughs> well i tell you what I know exactly what you're saying, Steve, and I, I'm afraid I'm, I have a, a very like-minded way, way of thinking about it. I've never been a fame seeker at all because, you know, for, there's one very important reason. I mean, with working with a guy like Elton, I mean, <laughs> what am I going to try and do, upstage him in some way? I don't <laughs> think so, and that's never been my, my aim because, you know, especially with, with my career with Elton, for example, because some people, quite a lot of people know who I am, and it's very nice when they ask me stuff or they, you know, I might see somebody in, in maybe in the grocery store, the, the supermarket, and they'll say, oh, you know, I loved what you did on this album. And, and it, they're very nice to me. They're very kind, you know, and, and that to me is the whole deal. If somebody's going to come up and say something nice, you know, because that's fine. I've never been a fame seeker because it would be stupid And on one point. Uh, I do understand also, as Steve was, was um, intimating, it was about... Today, especially with, you know, all the social media platforms, um, I started doing Instagram this January because my daughter, who is a, a designer and a wonderful artist, mm -hmm. and she said, you know, Dad, you've got to do this. Because you, when you sit around the house occasionally playing guitar, you should just have, have, your mom, have mom film you or something. And, you know, but anyway, I got really good at it. So 
I now post something on Instagram probably twice a week. Wow. You know, maybe something I've just written or something that somebody on Instagram, a follower has asked me to play. For example, there was a guitar solo I did in the late 80s on an album called Red Strikes Back. It was uh, one of the last Elton, uh, Elton albums before he, he got sober. Uh, it's a great album, some great stuff on it. And there was a song called A Word in Spanish. So one of the followers of my Instagram page uh, asked me, would you play the solo for A Word in Spanish? And I thought, oh, fuck, that's a hard one. And I thought, am I going to get it in one take? Because I didn't actually get it in one take when I did it, the original solo with Chris Thomas. Um, it was a whole take of 20 bars. And then it was like I had to drop in for the last flourish, which was on Spanish guitar. Um, but yeah, it, it's a thing that Instagram I'm, I'm really enjoying because I feel that I'm in touch now with people who like our music and mm. who like what I've done. And it's much more casual. It's not something creepy. Um, yeah. They can't get at me in any way, and it, it's actually quite fun. So I'm enjoying that, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing how much it's helped my daughter's uh, career with her, her as a designer, for example. And it's great for me to to be in touch with our our fans, and they ask yeah. me stuff, and I try and answer as honestly as I can. So my favorite one then, uh, any gigs stand up in mind that were like funny one offs, odd places to play at, or whatever. John Mayen, for example. You guys had done one in Russia for a wedding and you're in a strip club and he had to play around the strip pole because there was no room on the stage. Is there any uh, gigs that stand out to each of you guys that are, that are funny worth telling? Well, I can think of one. I, I remember um, there was a band called Canterbury Glass and they wanted me to join them as a, as a guitarist. And I, I used to go, go up and play a few solos with them and at harmonica. And they were booked to play a wedding. And this was at a place called the Four Feathers Club, um, just off of Edgware Road near the, uh, the tube station in London. Okay. And um, it became apparent as the evening or the afternoon wore on that it was a shotgun wedding, that the bride was pregnant and that the guy had been forced to marry her. And really, they should have booked the band you know, it was the era of the last waltz, the song rather than the film, um, <clears throat> and Engelbert Humperdinck. They, they should have had something like that people could dance to and smooch <laughs> to. And all that. Instead of which, they booked this band called Canterbury Glass. <laughs> and um, um, they weren't happy with the band's music. You know, they were playing some originals and what have you. Anyway... I'd maybe just done a harmonica solo and I was just watching from out front because there was a stage and um, th they were saying, oh, can't you play something else? The band And the band were getting very unhappy and the, and the band on stage decided to have a freak out and they started getting the microphones and they were running it up and down the, the speaker columns and creating feedback noises and, you know, trying to, do something that that plainly the who did better and more professionally and shouldn't have even gone anywhere near it anyway the audience <laughs> or the guests attacked the stage and started <laughs> dragging the leads out of the microphones and shutting the band up and eventually the police were called etc and i was watching all this from a distance thinking you know this is like a scene from the wild west it's um <laughs> you know I hope no one's going to turn on me, you know. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not with the band. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I've only had my harmonica player. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. Brilliant. No, 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 no. no. They owe me money. <laughs> oh, that's classic. No, I, we, had one, we had one that was just ridiculous. I mean, we've had lots of weird gigs. I mean, we played on the, the top of, mountain, uh, of a mountain in, in uh, Innsbruck. I mean, we played in uh, another top of another mm -hmm. mountain in, in uh, Malaysia. I mean, ridiculous I don't, I don't know who thinks of these things, you know. Uh, and here's a classic, all right? We were booked to play. Um, there's a gig called The Love Ride. I don't know if you know what that is, but every year, the Harley Davidson oh, Motorcycle sure. Organization, they have a thing called The Love Ride. So all these big, giant, tough bikers uh, and whatever, and all their girlfriends and all the rest of it, they all rolled into Milwaukee, where it was. And now we... Oh, fuck knows why we're, we're the band who were booked to play at this event 
right? Now I had heard, and I'm going like, why do they want us to play there? They're going kind to, of, you know, it's like we are not the band to be to be on stage here. And I'd heard a glimmer that maybe one of the artists uh, they picked would be the Stones. Uh, another one would have been um, Aerosmith. Now both those choices would have been fantastic and absolutely spot on. But anyway, we were it. <laughs> so comes the gig and we'd all been woken up first thing in the morning by the sound of, you know, about 10,000 Harleys, you know, revving into this, the, the theater. And, and we get to the gig and um, there was a, a curtain for some reason of this auditorium we were playing. And um, we got on stage, we're ready to go. The curtains open and the bikers all see us as we were going into our first number. I forget what it was. And they look at, they see Elton and they go, Fuck off! <laughs> Get, no way! Get off the fucking stage! We don't want this! You know, we, it was hilarious. And, you know, we were all just like, oh my God, this is great. But what we did was, well, let's just play like Saturday Night's Right for Fighting straight away. So we did that. We went into Saturday night and then we played the bitches back. And then they kind of come, all right, this is okay. So we, <laughs> we kept that. We suddenly put all these rockers and took all the tuneful melodic things out of the set. But it was it was a classic case of wrong band for this occasion, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my friend Rocco Reedy's question, which I asked in the last one, and I really liked it. it was a Carmine Apice was in the last one, and I asked it. It was a who um, who's the most interesting um, person you've ever met who's not a rock star? Oh my god. Uh Princess Margaret. Oh, wow. Wow. How about that? Can't top yeah, that no. one. No, that's crazy. I think, I think you've won that one. Yeah. Where yes. did you meet her then? How was she? We, we, we met her several times. Um, when I was with Magna Carta, we, got, uh, we were playing a Save the Children concert with the Beach Boys in the Albert Hall in London. And that's her charity, Save the Children. That's, that was what she was most known for. And she was a tremendously kind lady anyway. So we played there with Magna Carta, and afterwards we got invited back to Kensington Palace to go and hang out with her and uh, Tony, <laughs> Lord Snowden, sorry, and all these various, you know, snooty aristocrats who were there. Uh, and I got to, to, it was quite nerve wracking in a way because the food they were serving was chicken curry. So I went and got my chicken curry, just as I've got my rice with the curry on top. Davy Johnstone, Princess Margaret would like to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, and I'm holding this plate of curry. And I'm going, well, and he said, no, bring it with you. It's okay. So I, I, I sit down on this little stool because you've always got to be below her in height. You can't be above her in height. So I'm sitting on this little stool so with my plate of chicken curry. And she goes, so wonderful music. And she's talking to me about the set. And she was really knowledgeable and really cool, you know. And she's obviously, she was aware of the fact that I was having difficulty balancing this plate with the chicken leg and curry on it. And she said, pick it up, pick it up. And I was like, and from then on, we were kind of like friends because I started laughing because I thought it was hilarious when she said that. <laughs> and fast forward a couple of years later, when Elton, I just joined Elton's band and we were opening the Shaw Theatre in London. And she was, again, one of the patron saints of that, one of the saints of that. So she was coming in with Roger Moore and these people like that and all these big stars and everything. And, and Elton was introducing the band to her. And it comes to me and Elton says, yes, and this is my guitar player, Davey. And she goes, oh, I know Davey. That's fine. And Elton was most put out. He didn't like that at all. Because <laughs> I didn't let on, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. It's very good. Oh dear. Yeah. That's good one. That's Thanks great. Good. Do you have any in mind, Steve? Oh, oh God, you know, I'm just trying to think. I I did know a number of actors at, at one time, and it was through a guy called Ralph Bates, who um oh, yeah. was did you know Ralph Bates? Yeah. I, I never mean, knew him, but I loved what he was doing. <laughs> right. Well, Ralph was was extraordinary. He was an extraordinary actor. And um I just because I, I met so many actors through him, you know, lots of yeah. lots of famous actors, and um, the, the lovely thing about him and and, and his wife, I mean, he's no no longer of this earth, but um, 
uh, I was living nearby. They they had an antique shop um, nearby. I was living in Princedale Road off of Holland Park Avenue in London. And um, um, as I befriended them, and they realized I was on my own a lot of the time. Um, and uh, they invited me around every every Sunday I became part of the family and they, it seems as if they took in all the strays, you know, around that area area. So they would regularly have 10 people in, you know, whether they were musicians or they were, you know, owners of carpet shops nearby. So there was all of that, but then, you know, they would have actors and you you'd bump into people all the time um, that were either working or out of work. And, um, some hugely famous, some you, you wouldn't know. Others, there were a lot of people who'd been involved with the Hammer horror movies. Mm. And I got mm. to meet the whole team. There was Jimmy Sangster, who often wrote and directed and just did everything with these things. And they turned them around very, very quickly. And they still look very, very good, uh, those, those movies. So lots mm. of vampire movies and Frankenstein movies and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it was fascinating to me because I remember going to see those things when I was a young kid, underage, getting into the cinema, seeing these things that had an X-rated certificate. And uh, and it was great to be able to uh, meet the people that have put that mm. stuff together. So sure. it was an introduction to a, a world of theatre outside and another kind of entertainment. And um, I just used to sit there spellbound as they would tell stories and go into their act. And I used to think, well, I think I'm an entertainer, but look at these people, you know, they can do it with their voices, with their, yeah. Yeah. With their, with their hands. They can go into impressions and do, and do things. And it's, it was extraordinary to me. You know, I felt really, you know, so introverted by comparison to them. Steve, did you know, did you ever know Ray Cooper? Our percussionist. Yes, I've met Ray Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely guy. Ray's yeah. Ray's one of those guys who comes from theatre, you know. And... Yes, I think he said that to me. Yeah, I saw him with. Uh, I think I might have seen him with Rick Wakeman. Okay. Yes. Yeah. What a what a, what a character, and uh, he's yeah. still totally steeped in that in that theatrical way of life. He still dresses yes. like he's come from the nineteen forties or something. It's unbelievable. And yeah. it's just a great guy. But yeah, he does a lot of, um, you know, he worked with George with Handmade Films and yes. did a lot of the yeah. Python stuff and then the ones That's after. Right. Yes. So yeah, a huge yeah. theatrical thing. I, it's so closely linked, but I love hearing the stories of, yeah. of oh, these yeah. people. Yes. Yeah. No, he's incredible and, 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 and impressive. Even with just a tambourine, the man could be impressive. How is it possible to be impressive? I've only seen two people who are, who are impressive with a, a tambourine. And one's him. And uh, the other one is Ayeto Marrera, who can do a, a drum solo on one tambourine in front Ooh. of the mic. Extraordinary. Wow. Yeah, because he can get all these different tones out of it. Uh, but um, but Ray is, is fabulous and fabulous um, uh, 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 percussionist. Now, you mentioned uh, Python. Monty Python was signed to the same label as Genesis. Um, it was Charisma Records, yeah. Tony Stratton Smith. Yeah, who had yeah. managed the Nice, and he'd also managed uh, the Bonzo Dog Duda Band, which <laughs> I think was, was the comedy connection with all those guys. And um, yeah. the Bonzos had some, a lot of funny stuff. Yeah. Oh man. Um, if so, you guys did Carpet Crawlers in 1999. If that was to be the Genesis Swan song, because of Phil Collins's unfortunate ailing health, which. I'm not trying to make it a negative thing. I'm not, but would you uh, would you say that would be a fine swan song for Genesis? That recording, uh, carp carpet crawls. Uh, well, that version of it was re-recorded, and um, I mean, I do it live. I know Genesis did it live with their recent tour. That re-recording has got about two notes on it from me, and I'd, I'm not even sure that the band's on it. You know, it's it's one of those. It was a production. Mm. And um, and so I, for me, it smacks of the corporate, corporate thing. So I'm I'm not sure that I, I, no one has written to me and said what a great version that was. I think fans either prefer the original or they prefer something that's perhaps more 
authentic and less corporate. Got it. And so I, I've got a different take on it. You know what? What I would. Well, I mean, I have re-recorded it, and it's about to come out again. Funnily enough, <laughs> on a live album, I'm going to go and sign all these copies tomorrow. So, uh, did you ever um, go to any of the Mike and Mechanic shows? I did. Yes, I, I saw him when it when he had the hit with Living Years. Yeah. And, um, yes. I mean, it's got to be neat for you guys when you know you're chums, you're friends, and you hear these masterpieces coming from them, and you're like, "Good job!" I mean, wow, it's it's got to be exciting to see your brothers in arms do so well. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think Elton's fantastic as well. You know, I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. You know, it's an extraordinary level of energy. Um, well, you said, and I watched a really good interview you did, Davey, and the, and the, he. He said to you, said, you know, Elton wanted to be the biggest rock star in history. And I mean, he's pretty much got to the point of that. It's remarkable yeah, he, when you think of it. He, he did pretty much achieve what he set out to do. I think more interestingly, interestingly was the fact that he's been able to sustain it and maintain that level of, of um, brilliance in his live music when he's up on stage live. I've never heard him sing out of tune, for example. I've never heard him play a shit No, I mean, he's a monster. Uh, he just keeps doing it really well. Um, yeah, he became the biggest rock star in the world. And then, and there's so many of them now, obviously. But, um, you know, I know we're, it's interesting now that we're touring uh, for the last, uh, it's the last 10 months now of our touring career. So next, uh, next July, middle of July next year, we'll be done touring. That'll be it. And I'm going to go back to... Um, doing my own stuff, my own writing and working yeah. for other people and producing other people and stuff. Um, yeah. But it's been a great ride. As far as actors, I might've been told that you had met Steve McQueen at one point. And uh, is there any, how did you meet him and, and Paul Newman too? Are there, are, uh, is there any good stories was, wrapped up with those guys? Cause Steve McQueen stuff is kind of neat. Oh, he, he was absolutely brilliant. Cause obviously, I mean, I was a huge fan uh, and also he was with Ali McGraw at the time and we were in El Paso playing the second or third concert of my first tour. So 1972, it'd be like March or something. And we we're in Waco, Texas. And we started in Waco. Then we went to Houston. Then we went to El Paso. And Steve McQueen was shooting the getaway there with Sam Peckinpah, the famous director, the famous nuts out of his mind director. And uh, we went along, we were invited to go along and watch them doing a couple of scenes. And, and it was at the time when, uh, you know, those electronic blood things, when they exploded, when the guy would shoot and the guy, the whole front of the guy's jacket would be covered in blood Squib, and blow up, right? you know. Squib, I think. And Peckinpah was the first, he was the main guy to start doing that, that kind of stuff. So we got to watch that and it was great. And we got to hang out with Steve and Ali, who was a sweetheart. Uh, I see her occasionally because she lives in California. Mm -hmm. And um, and they both came to the, the show that night. They both came and he was sitting in the front row, rolling up some joints and smoking, you know, having a great time. He was a lovely, lovely man. We adored mm -hmm. him. Yeah. 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 But it's the Paul Newman. Um, Paul Newman. I had never met Paul Newman. I would love oh. to have. Love oh, him. I think Absolutely he's my him. favorite actor. Cool Hand okay. Luke is just so right. neat you know, it's yeah. so tough i don't know so anyway. many great ones i mean i'm a huge actor movie buff i just love movies and all that stuff just love it yeah yeah me too more and more i don't know i like the music stuff better personally but i've been listening to you guys all week it's been a pretty good week for me i've been walking oh. around in a very good mood <laughs> so thank you to both of you uh, if you have any other stories that you want to share please 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 or any questions for each other go for it i thought this was a thing about roadies the witch I thought this was a talk about roadies. Am I uh, road, wait, do you have any roadies that you would never hire again? <laughs> uh, probably, but I'm not going to say who they are. Yeah, exactly. have a tough yeah, probably. Next tour. yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, we, we, uh, we'll get back yeah. at you. We'll get back at you. <laughs> yeah. Well, well they, I, I have to say, of course, um, people may not be aware of this, but road crews work far harder, you know, because they're part of the setup and the breakdown long after the, the act has been on and shot his or her bolt. And, mm. um, but the crew are there, uh, you know, we, we just did a place, which I think you guys did, which is Taormina in, um, in, um, uh, uh, in Sicily. And um, uh, it, 
an ancient theatre, Greco-Roman thing, and and uh, that was terribly difficult for them to um, to set up for that, you know, because they couldn't get the truck near the thing. So they were up at five in the morning, you know, getting the gear to this ancient site and and, and doing it. I believe Elton did it. Whether he did it with the band or, or no, he did it. He but, did it solo. There was just too much to get the whole band over there. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can imagine that. And but uh, you know, so you know, we finished late because Italian gigs are late. They go on late there, and and um, and so you know, I mean, they're, they're, these guys are up pretty, practically twenty four hours at, at, at a stretch doing this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah. so roadies are, are are the real heroes. Of this, you know, they, I totally are... agree with you, Steve, and I'm I'm really glad you brought this up, man. I'm really glad you you, you brought this up because I'd love to say that that I mean, with the tour that we're doing right now, or have been doing for the last six years, or however it is, including the COVID time, uh, the staging is gigantic. It's enormous, and what they have to do, uh, the video, the video walls, and the whole thing, the production factor, um, it's unbelievable. Our crew are absolutely incredible. And as you say, they're the real heroes. They're the unsung heroes. And all the way from our front of house sound guy, I mean, Matty Harris, our front of house guy, his assistant, Nick, who's a wonderful Australian um, PA person who actually made me an amp. You might be interested in Steve. Right. It's, um, it's, about, it's about this size. It's um, made from a, a little, a, a, a tissue, an old tube, uh, what do you call it? Um, a thing of hair gel and a, a tub of hair gel. And he obviously cleans out the hair gel and then he, he picks it up and you've got a one watt amp. It just sounds amazing. It's really? just screaming. No. Yeah. yeah it's really? fantastic. But anyway, all these, these road crew people are, and it's a calling for them. Everybody as much as it's a calling for us to play music, I believe because yeah. anybody who's willing to be as loyal as they are because they love a band's music or whatever, uh, because that's the way it is for our, with our crew anyway. They absolutely love what we're doing. And we try and give back to them, you know, hanging out with them. And we get to be backstage with them occasionally, if not for COVID. But yeah, they're, they're the ones who, who really deserve. Yeah. I've actually got to hit it. It's 2.59. I've got it. I, I know it's much earlier than you, Steve. No, yeah. Listen, I, got, I, I must say, thank you so much for... We're, for we're, we're both absolutely. challenged for time in, in, in our own way here, but it's been great yes. talking and it's been great hooking up with both of yes. you. Yes, thank you. And uh, yes. we'll do it again at some point, I'm sure. I'd love to. Are you in London? Yeah, London, Teddington. I'd say, where about to you? You're, you're, you've I'm got out to be in California. The I'm, I'm just north California. of LA. Right, so, okay. so yeah, but, but we'll be over next year yeah. to do some shows yes. in the... And like oh, May or June, hope to like hook that. up. Hope to hook yes. up. I'd love to come to a show. Love Fantastic. to. Fantastic. And you're Fabulous. welcome to come to, to uh, ours, of course. You know. Lovely. Like I'd love my to. guys. Yeah. 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 Sure. All right, all guys. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Be, be the yeah, best. Joe. All the best to you, man. Cheers. Take Cheers. Care. Bye, Steve. Bye, bye. Cheers, David. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>